Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo. Optimisme is een verantwoordelijkheid als er een natuurramp gebeurt. Vertrouw jij dan je leven toe aan het feit dat mobiele telefoons en internetverbindingen nog werken? Vertrouw je daar het leven van je gezinsleden aan toe? Ik dacht het niet. Amateurradio. Communicatie die altijd blijft werken. Goedenavond, dit is de lange uitzending van de Daily Minutes, ook bekend als PNLDL Nieuws. In deze wekelijkse uitzending beginnen we met de Amateur Radio Nieuwslijn met de datum van deze vrijdag met wereldwijd nieuws over onze hobby in het Engels. Aan het eind van de uitzending zenden we de Deutschland Roen Sproeg uit, het landelijk nieuws van die week van de Duitse amateurvereniging DARC. Deze bijdrage is in het Duits. Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2140, with a release date of Friday, November 2nd, 2018, to follow in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The following is a QST. A renowned contester dies in a tragic tower accident. Radio scouts add up the score after jamboree on the air. And the RMS Queen Mary set sail for satellites. All this and more as Amateur Radio Newsline Report 2140 comes your way right now. From around the world, this is Newsline, Amateur Radio's first independent on-the-air news and bulletin service. Now reporting from Charleston, West Virginia, here's Jim Dameron, NATMW. As Newsline went to production, the amateur radio community was rocked by the news that noted contester Paul Bittner, W0AIH, had suffered a fatal fall from a tower at his Superstation's antenna farm near Eau Claire, Wisconsin. According to his longtime friend, Alan Schlaggett, N9ISN, Paul had been working October 31st on his 180-foot tower when the rope broke. Paul fell 60 feet. Allen told Newsline that emergency responders were called and they pronounced him dead at the scene. A retired Lutheran minister, Paul had participated in the World Radio Sport Team Championship in Germany this past summer. He and Allen had competed together in the CQ Worldwide DX contest in October and had just posted a score of about 2.2 million points. Paul's many honors included induction in 2009 into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. A ham for almost seven decades, Paul Bittner was 85. Newsline will have more on his life and long career in next week's report. Varley, Paul. The world's largest event in scouting, Jamboree on the Air, is over, and all that remains now is the counting. The global event is all about ham radio, and ham shacks in October were filled with youngsters calling CQ. Last year, there were more than 1.5 million scouts participating from more than 160 countries. Bill Stearns, NE4RD, tells us how scouts in the United States are wrapping things up. This week in radio scouting, another great jamboree on the air is in the books. We have one activation from Scout Camps on the air, and we look ahead to the World Jamboree 2019. CQ Jamboree, CQ Jamboree, this is Oscar Echo 3, Bravo Lima Sierra. Oscar Echo 3, Bravo Lima Sierra, listening through. Oscar Echo 3, Bravo Lima Sierra, this is Whiskey Bravo 7, Oscar Echo Papa, Reno, Nevada, USA. There was a lot of activity on the bands during Jota weekend, and a lot of people participated that maybe thought they wouldn't. Now is the time to file your report of your activity. Even if you didn't register your station, or maybe you only worked one Jota station, we want your report in our records for the accuracy of the annual report. Head over to K2BSA slash Jota dash station dash report to file right now. Even though Jota is over, radio scouting continues on with an activation from our scout camps on the air site. Thomas Barker, WA1HRH, will be activating W1M at the November Camporee at the Moses Scout Reservation in Russell, Massachusetts on November 11th. They'll have their trusty FT897 set up with a dipole and plan on being active on HF. They'll be on or around the scout frequencies as band conditions allow. The next big adventure in radio scouting will be happening in early August next year, and this will be the World Jamboree 2019 occurring at the Summit Bechtel Reserve in West Virginia. Balloon launches, ARDF, ARIS, and demonstration stations for HF, satellite, soda, and digital are some of the activities planned. 
If you're interested in aiding our efforts at the World Jamboree or finding out more information about the operation plans, head over to our landing page for it at na1wj.net. For more information on radio scouting, please visit our website at k2bsa.net. For Amateur Radio Newsline and the K2BSA Amateur Radio Association, this is Bill Stearns, NE4RD. Young hams in South Africa are helping one another embrace CW. John Williams, VK4JJW, has that story. What started as a twice-weekly meet-up on Google Hangouts for a group of enthusiastic young hams in South Africa has developed into a daily routine of confident QSRs on HF using CW. Daryl ZS6DLL, Sean ZS6SR and Mike ZS6MSW are among the group of about five newcomers to code who were inspired by the success of hams in the SOTA program who've been using it to beat bad band conditions. Although their initial plan to help one another polish their skills was hatched on a local two-metre repeater, the group actually went off the air and into Google Hangouts before things could start happening. Twice a week, they engaged in a one-hour practice session there without having to worry about sunspots. Then, four months later, they decided they were ready for prime time. Now most of them are on the air daily, says Daryl. He told Newsline, You can switch on the rig at 1700 every day and hear CW signals and make a QSO, which is something you wouldn't have heard a year ago. In fact, the amount of CW ops still active on the bands, you could count on one hand. Off the air, the group is also involved in a CW group on WhatsApp that has 24 participants, ranging from newcomers to veterans. Daryl said it's turning out to be a great platform for questions and collaboration. He said that with interest spreading outside South Africa, even as far away as Korea, the group plans to return to Google Hangouts for another learning session. Daryl's quite pleased. Making a reference to the open grasslands found throughout South Africa, he told Newsline, We've set the veldt on fire here in South Africa. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm John Williams, VK4JJW. How do hams help an old established observatory mark 175 years of operation? Jack Parker, W8ISH, tells us how. It's nowhere near as old as the stars and planets, but at 175 years of age, the Cincinnati Observatory Center is one of the Western Hemisphere's oldest observatories still in operation. To mark its anniversary, the Okayan Amateur Radio Society is hosting special event station K8SCH on the HF bands from November 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time through November 11th at 1159 p.m. Club members will be working from their home QTHs throughout the weekend, and the club itself will be on the premises of the observatory on the 9th of November between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. local time. The observatory has the distinction of having had former President John Quincy Adams preside at its dedication November 9, 1843, when he helped lay the cornerstone of the original building. Though the observatory is now at a different location further east that takes it away from the city pollution, it has been designated as a National Historic Landmark and still uses the original 11-inch Murs and Mahler refractor telescope. Be listening, and perhaps you too can make contact from afar with what was originally called the Lighthouse of the Sky. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. Regulators in Belgium may soon be introducing a license to ease radio operations for visiting hams. Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, has those details. Belgium's communications regulator, BIPT, has told the nation's amateur radio associations that it wants to introduce a CEPT novice license. CEPT, the European Telecommunications Authority, has agreements to allow compatible HARIC compliant full and novice license holders in signatory countries to travel to other such nations in Europe and go on the air without the need for additional permits or licenses. The current Belgian novice license allows 50 watts output on all modes. The revision to the CEPT compatible novice specification would permit 100 watts output on the HF bands and 6 metres, with 50 watts on 2 metres and 70 centimetres. The proposed CEPT novice licensee would have access to all HF bands except 60 metres, plus a portion of 160 metres as well as 6 metres, 2 metres and 70 centimetres. 
BIPT is also proposing a reduction in power for the country's entry-level licensees, and similarly reducing the allowable 50 watt output on all modes to 40 watts PEP for SSB and 10 watts for FM. The regulator has also said that comments or even alternative proposals are welcome. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. Time for you to identify your station. We are the Amateur Radio Newsline, heard on bulletin stations around the world, including the K4LYL repeater in Bedford, Virginia, on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. local time. A world-renowned luxury liner, now docked in California, will be the site of some satellite activity, as we hear from Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. The RMS Queen Mary, renowned for bringing luxury accommodations to travelers on the ocean, is preparing next for a voyage into near space. Well, sort of. The Associated Radio Amateurs of Long Beach is getting ready for a day of satellite operations aboard the luxury liner, which is docked at Long Beach in Southern California. The hams are getting on the air on December 15th with the call sign W6RO, the call sign for the Nate Brightman Wireless Room on board the liner. The shack, which opened in 1979, is named for the silent key K6OSC, who operated amateur station GB5QM on board the ship during its final cruise from England to Long Beach, California in 1967. He then worked for more than a decade to see the establishment of a permanent amateur radio station on board the ship. According to the club's page on QRZ.com, satellite operations will include sideband, FM, and possibly packet, and the operators are hoping to include some HF activity as well. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. An amateur radio operator in Wales has taken on a new task for the Radio Society of Great Britain. Jeremy Boot, G4NJH, tells us more. Amateur radio has always been an adventure of discovery for Simon Taylor, MW0NWN, who said the hobby's diverse activities were what drew him to ham radio in the first place. Now he's taking that affinity to the next level and helping the Radio Society of Great Britain create a better relationship with an eclectic group of hams. There are more than 30 of them, he told Newsline, and the RSGB strategy for the year 2022 includes letting national affiliates enjoy the same kind of direct support and representation that local clubs have. That's where Simon's work begins. He's the Radio Society's first honorary officer for national affiliated club societies and special interest groups, a newly created voluntary position designed to develop a deeper dialogue with these groups. Simon told Newsline that the new relationships will initially include written support agreements to be drawn up between the RSGB and the affiliated societies and encouragement to contribute more material for RADCOM, the society's member member magazine. He said the affiliates will also be encouraged to have a greater presence at the National Hamfest, the National Convention and other major rallies in the UK. For now, he said, the focus is simply on understanding the needs of this large and varied group, one that embraces everything from QRP operation or direction finding to collection of vintage and military equipment. Simon told Newsline, I hope my passion for this diversity encourages the various groups to join in our conversation. Who knows, he said, I may even be tempted to try something new, and my own interest in the hobby may take a surprising and unexpected direction. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. The founder of a net for hams who love D-Star and railroads has a message for everyone who's checked in so far. Here's Paul Brown, WD9GCO. The D-Star Trains Net has just marked its first year on the air, bringing train and railroad enthusiasts together once a week to talk about one of their favorite subjects. Daryl Stout, WX1DER, who calls himself the Net's Conductor, told Newsline that he is pleased with so many hams coming on board, but said that not everyone has claimed their commemorative certificate. He and Paul Fry, canine PTF, designed the certificate, which is emailed to hams after their first check-in, and that is the date that appears on the certificate. 
If you need a certificate or a replacement, send Daryl an email at wx1der at gmail.com. Of course, if you're not yet all aboard, the net meets on D-Star Reflector 26 Alpha every Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Participants can expect a bit of railroad trivia provided by Paul. The net is conducted to honor its predecessor that ran on Echolink for more than eight years, and also in the memory of Daryl's late uncle Frank, K3VRM, the youngest engineer hired by the Penn Central Railroad. Daryl told Newsline that it was Uncle Frank who gave him his love of trains and, of course, ham radio. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. In this week's World of DX, be listening for Andy, OE7AJH, who is active holiday style mornings and evenings as 5R8UP from Madagascar. He's on the air from the 3rd through the 13th of November operating CW and SSB on 40 through 10 meters and possibly 80 meters. Send QSLs via his home call, direct or the bureau. Be listening for Michael, DF8AN, who is operating on Christmas Island as VK9XQ from the 3rd to the 6th of November, and again from the 9th through the 17th of November. He'll be operating from the Cocos Islands as VK9CH from the 6th to the 9th of November. At both locations, he'll be operating mainly CW, RIDI, and other digital modes, and can be found on 160 through 6 meters. QSL via his home call, direct, or bureau, or EQSL. Starting on the 3rd of November and through the end of December, you can listen for special event station IY1EY operating from Loano. The station is commemorating Guglielmo Marconi's experiments that were conducted in the Ligurian Sea aboard his yacht Elettra from 1919 through 1936. Listen on all bands, both in CW and SSB. A special QSL card courtesy of IK1QBT. The Ducey Island de-expedition, VP6D, closed down early at 1630 UTC on the 31st of October due to bad weather, and while many were undoubtedly disappointed that they didn't get a contact with them, it was nice to see all the compliments and good wishes for a safe return home to the team on the DX cluster. We conclude this week with a story about a tribute to Lithuania's ham radio satellites, a tribute that's golden. Here's Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. Let's talk money. Depending upon how well you equip your shack, amateur radio can end up costing you a couple of coins. If you're a ham in Lithuania, however, or even if you're not, there are now some new amateur radio coins that can end up costing you a couple of regular coins. These are gold commemorative ones valued at 5 euros. That's a little more than $5 in U.S. currency, and the Bank of Lithuania is issuing them on the 6th of November. They honour the nation's two amateur radio CubeSats, the Lithuanica Sat-1 and LitSat-1, both of which were launched to the International Space Station in January of 2014 and then deployed from there on February 28 of that same year. The Lithuanica Sat-1's payload included an FM transponder and camera, and the LitSat-1 was carrying a linear transponder for SSB and CW developed by a ham. The coin bears the images of both CubeSats, as well as the Lithuanian coat of arms, which appears as a constellation of stars. LitSat-1 also broadcast a three-word message shortly after it left the ISS. Transmitted in Lithuanian, the words translate to Lithuania loves liberty, and hams in Brazil, Germany and Estonia were the first to receive that signal. It all made Lithuania's presence in space as good as gold, and now the nation has the currency to prove it. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. With thanks to Alan Labs, Alan Schlag at N9ISN, Amateur News Weekly, the ARRL, Ceci De Benedetto, KD8OOB, Cincinnati Observatory Website, CQ Magazine, Daryl Lamb, ZS6DLL, Hap Holly and the Rain Report, Marty Soloway, KC1CWF, 
Ohio Penn DX Bulletin, Radio Society of Great Britain, Southgate Amateur Radio News, Ted Randall's QSO Radio Show, Wireless Institute of Australia, WTWW Shortwave, and you, our listeners, that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline. Please send emails to our address at newsline at arnewsline.org. More information is available at Amateur Radio Newsline's only official website at www.arnewsline.org. For now, with Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT, at the News Desk in New York, and our news team worldwide, I'm Jim Dameron, N8TMW in Charleston, West Virginia, saying 73. And as always, we thank you for listening. Amateur Radio Newsline is copyright 2018, all rights reserved. We'll hear about the golden age of DIY in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. From the studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, with the October 27th Rain Report. Homebrewing is alive and well. In fact, this is the golden age of DIY, according to George Sephiropoulos, KJ6VU, co-host of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. This is an excerpt from his 2018 Dayton Hamvention Forum talk on the golden age of DIY. The spirit of this talk is the golden age of do-it-yourself. And the reason I say that it's the golden age of DIY is that never before has there been so many resources available to us as amateurs or kind of like hobbyist, electronic, geeky maker type guys. And the internet... Uh, which was projected to be the death of ham radio, in many ways is the fuel for amateur radio in, in unanticipated ways, not least of which is this phenomenal resource of information and accessibility to hardware from all over the world. If I go to DigiKey and I want to build a synthesizer, it would take me about uh, $12 to $15 worth of parts, and I have to make a circuit board. I could buy one assembled from China, get it in three days for about $7. So this turns the whole you know, thinking of D- D- DIY kind of on its head. With the advent of embedded software and microcontrollers being very easily accessible by normal people who are hobbyists, not professional engineers, it's really uh, incredible. So I'm going to touch on a few things, but before that, how many of you have ever listened to our podcast? Well, I should say, how many haven't listened to it? If you haven't listened to it, if this is at all interesting, I would encourage you to listen to it. It's free, so it's ham priced. You can go to the web. You can uh, get it on Apple Podcasts or any popular uh, podcasting app. We put out a show every two weeks. They're two hours long. That's the short form. Sometimes they go to three hours. It's not because we like to hear ourselves talk. Well, it is that, but it's because there's so much to talk about. When Jeremy and I first started this thing, we said we want to make a technically oriented podcast. We don't want a podcast where someone shows up and says, uh, let me tell you about an Arduino. It's a microcontroller and you could build stuff with it. Oh, thanks. That's fascinating. That's been done. We wanted to go deeper than that. Like, okay, what are the pins on that thing and what are they used for and what does I2C mean and should I care? Or, you know, is that something that an experienced person would care about or something that a novice would want to care about? So we want to go technically deep and at the same time introduce you to stuff that you may be a complete noob with. The interesting thing about these technical hobbies like this is Nobody knows everything. We all know something really well. Maybe we really know metal fabrication. Maybe we really know embedded software. Maybe we really know RF circuit design. Nobody knows everything, and I'm constantly amazed at how much I don't know, but I can turn around to friends and other people I met that I can ask them, and they know. And then they'll learn something from me, and we kind of share. So that's the whole deal. So the podcast is all about that. It's all about learning and it's all about encouraging people to do hands-on stuff. So to that end, we've uh, come up with some build projects. We're not a kit company. We don't want to be a kit company. Frankly, this is a big pain in my rump. But we want to provide some places to start. If you don't know what you want to build, you could buy one of our circuit boards, and you could build a project. It may be as simple as a power pole junction box, or maybe as complicated as an antenna relay, but you kind of get your experience starting to build stuff. So we're starting to do more and more of that stuff. We have a lot of great guests. We have a lot of recurring guests. And generally, we just BS about radio. So you can go to hamradioworkbench.com. All of the episodes are there. On the average, they're two hours plus. So we have over 100 hours of 
technical content that hopefully you would enjoy on a variety of topics. Uh, there's also a DMR talk group. How many of you are on DMR or are planning to get on DMR? Great. We have a talk group, which means that you can connect your DMR radio to our hub and chit-chat with ourselves and a bunch of other people interested in the same stuff. So it's another way to build community, but with a push-to-talk button. HamRadioWorkbench.com. Uh, we also have a p Facebook page, which is very active. We have about 600 subscribers, and uh, a lot of people get on there, hey, here's my project, want to show it off, or hey, I need to design an antenna tuner, what should I do? You know, so there's a lot of give and take, and also we have a, a Twitter feed, and for quick, short messages and things coming up uh, and newsy stuff, we'll put stuff there. The way we uh, build this session was that Jeremy, my partner, and I would talk about a whole bunch of stuff, but obviously that didn't happen because Jeremy's not here. He's over at the booth. So we edited the scope of this presentation down a little bit. So it's just me with no Jeremy. So why do I say this is the golden age of DIY ham radio? Uh, the reason at the, at the core, in my opinion, is it's a, we are at a confluence of factors here. We have all kinds of ham radio technology that's advancing. We have the whole microcontroller embedded processor, uh, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, Arduino action going on in the amateur DIY makerspace. So we should leverage that. There's tons of fancy integrated circuits that do wonderful things. Who has not heard of an SI5351? You, you can't not hear about it, right? That's one honest person in the back. You can buy sensors. I can go buy, for three bucks, I can buy a digital temperature sensor that I don't need to calibrate, and I can measure the temperature of my PA and decide if I should turn a fan on, which is a simple, useful project. 3D printing is, is really growing leaps and bounds, and a lot of people who build projects will 3D print a case for it or a bracket or some other accessory. Software-defined radio, uh, software development. It's never been easier to write code. Uh, for those of you who freaked out about writing code, it's really not that bad. And we have this internet thing that we can take advantage of in many different ways. The other thing that I find fascinating is there's a lot of cheap, good test equipment. When I say cheap, good test equipment, I mean a boxed test instrument that would have been $2,000 10 years ago is 400 bucks now with the same quality and probably better specs. You can get, I'll talk about another thing that's one of my favorites in a minute. It's a USB connected multifunction piece of test gear. Inexpensive. There's lots of cheap tools and parts to be had, uh, especially if you don't mind shopping on eBay. eBay is your friend. There's tons of stuff there. If you venture over into AliExpress, which is kind of the Chinese version, there's even more cheap stuff. There's a website called Banggood, which I thought would have been filtered out by my router, but it turns out Banggood's got all kinds of great deals on electronics. You can check it out. There's tons of kits. At the FDIM, Hans showed off his QCX transceiver. It's a little miracle. 49 bucks, 5 watt, uh, single band transceiver that also has a whisper beacon built into it just because. He has them for sale. If you, if you don't have one, you should get one. It's, it's a great project. You're listening to an excerpt from the 2018 Hamvention Forum Talk by George Safaropoulos, KJ6VU, co-host of the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast. We'll conclude George's talk after station ID. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, and you're listening to The Rain Report. You're listening to The Rain Report from www.therainreport.com. There's a growing interest in DIY. So what kills me is, is you'll, you'll hear some old fart hams talking on the radio. No one builds anything anymore. They're just hanging with the wrong crowd. They just haven't paid attention. Because uh, I think DIY ham radio is better now than, than any time that I've seen. Because of all of this enablement, all of this low-cost everything, and readily available and fabulous resources. And there's really fantastic small radio gear. So an AirSpy SDR for 50 to 100 bucks is a phenomenal receiver and piece of test equipment, by the way. If you're doing filters, you get an SDR dongle for 20 to 100 bucks and some diodes to make a noise source, and you can sweep a filter and look at the waveform on your you know, very cheap spectrum analyzer made with an SDR. It's not a, it's not a piece of you know, HP Agilent Keysight test equipment, but it's good enough to know where's the frequency range of the filter. So 
let's talk a little bit about your bench. And a lot of you said you're, you know, you're building a bench. And what is a bench? When I was a little kid, maybe the reason I do this is my dad, you know, we, we would move from house to house and every house we did, went into, the first thing that he did was build a workbench. So a workbench to me is a, is a special place. A workbench is where you escape to your little happy place to go do things and create and uh, beat up on electronics and torture parts and get creative and maybe build something useful. But it doesn't have to be a, you know, a big fancy workbench. It could be your kitchen table. Right? There's nothing wrong with the kitchen table. And, and you know, maybe a tackle box to put your stuff into it. You don't need a whole lot. A lot of us collect tools. We have more than we need. But all you really need is some hand tools, needle nose pliers, wire cutters, an X-Acto knife, some screwdrivers, a good soldering station. Don't scrimp on that. So for a couple hundred bucks, you can get kind of outfitted with 90% of what you really need to get off the dime and be able to do something. A power drill, super helpful for obvious reasons. Again, you don't need to spend a whole lot of money. My favorite power drill is a Ryobi because they're kind of disposable. If you loan it to your neighbor and it doesn't come back, you're not going to jump off the building. Um, and they're good enough. So for less than 100 bucks, you can get a decent drill. And you need some power supplies. If you do radios like HF radios or, or mobile VHF radios, you need a 20, 30 amp DC power supply. But you also want a low current power supply for your bench when you're doing small electronics. And so for that, you really want something that's 0 to 20 volts or thereabouts that is current limited. In other words, when you short something out and it draws a bunch of current, you don't want the power supply to comply with the request for more current. You want the power supply to pop the breaker effectively to your circuit so that you can save your electronics, figure out what's wrong, and then reset that current sensor. A few other things you might want to have. A digital multimeter. You can buy a really good, decent digital multimeter for $20, $25. You can go buy a Fluke for $150, but you don't need it, really. You're not making precise measurements. For the most part, most of the time, we're just trying to get an indication of power. Do you really need to know to four decimal points what the voltage is on the power supply? Probably not. You're good enough to a couple decimal points, so an inexpensive DMM is good enough. And you really need an oscilloscope. Almost anything you do, analog or digital, a scope opens your eyes so you can really see what's happening in the circuit. You want to start building up your parts selection. That's discretes like resistors, capacitors, uh, maybe an inductor or two, some diodes. You want to also start to build your vocabulary, your lexicon, if you will, of components that are integrated circuits. If you build radios and you want to build a, a, a signal generator, that Silicon Labs 5351 is a chip you should get to know how it works. Or if you want to build something in digital logic or digitally, maybe a microcontroller, uh, etc. And also get familiar with, with your favorite sources. There's the big commercial guys like DigiKey and Mauser and others. And then there's eBay, which is a fabulous source of inexpensive stuff. When I'm looking for something like a first-rate part, I'll go to one of the big distributors. If I need something more of a commodity, I'll just go to eBay. Because you can get 10 times as much for the same amount of money, and it's perfectly fine. So I would seriously consider that. You would like to have a computer. Tablet is marginal, in my opinion, for any electronics project. But a good computer, Windows tends to be better because there's more programs for engineering on Windows, but you can get, get by with a Mac. You might want to consider for audio interfacing to your computer, you can use your computer as an audio signal generator or even an audio spectrum analyzer. I wouldn't plug directly into my PC. I might use a USB fob, so if you fry it, you're going to fry the $20 fob, not the $1,000 computer. Little tip, that never happened to me. And you should also consider what skills do you want to build. I, I tend to accumulate stuff and don't learn to use it as well as I should because it's easy to buy stuff and it's hard to learn to use it. So if there's any one thing that I would recommend to myself to do differently, it's to spend more time to really learn how to use the things I already have. And there's some phenomenal videos on YouTube. Uh, there's videos on how to use a spectrum analyzer, how to use an oscilloscope, how to do RF design. I mean, there's so many videos. Take advantage of all that. And that concludes our excerpt from a 2018 Dayton Hamvention Forum presentation by George Sephiropoulos, KJ6VU, co-host of the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. The Rain Report is copyright 1990-2018 Rain. All rights are reserved.
The Rain Report updates Saturday mornings on the rainreport.com and Saturday evenings on WTWW, an international shortwave station out of Lebanon, Tennessee, on 5,085 kilohertz around 9 o'clock. Now for Rain's founder and producer, Hap Holly, KC9RP, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network. Keep on hamming! QSO Today, Episode 44, David Fries, W1HKJ. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. My QSO Today is with David Fries, W1HKJ, author of the FL series of software products, including FL Digi, winner of the 2014 ARRL Technical Excellence Award, longtime ham radio operator in Elmer. David's operating position has a number of computers in addition to radios. I'm quoting him from the Mac Ham Radio blog. Running all these computers is like an eight-manual organ. 90% of the time is spent on software development, 10% on operating. We will deep dive with David into FL Digi and other software later in this podcast. W1HKJ, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, David? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning, David. First, thanks for joining me on QSO today. Can we start at the very beginning of your ham radio story? Sure can. When and how did, it be, how, how did you become interested in ha- amateur radio? Um, my high school years were spent in New York City, and I had a friend whose dad was a ham radio operator. And I guess I was maybe 14 or 15 at the time. Mm-hmm. I visited his home, and his dad was in the basement surrounded by racks of World War II vintage radio equipment. And uh, he was operating CW at the time and carrying on a conversation with me and the CW conversation with the person on the other end of of that QSO. And I just was flabbergasted to see someone able to do that. And it stuck in my mind for years. I I didn't become a radio operator right away, but it was uh, it was an experience that kind of piqued my interest in ham radio. So you're an early vision of multitasking. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what year that was? That was about what time? Uh, yes, that was probably 1953, 1954. Uh huh. And um, and when did you get your first license? Uh, I went to the Coast Guard Academy, which is in New London, Connecticut, mm-hmm. and I was there from 56 to 60 as a, as a cadet. And in 1957, I received my, my first call sign, uh, and that was, let's see, I was 18 at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was a few years after that experience with my, my friend's dad. Mm-hmm. I actually learned CW first. Uh, for flashing light, and I could send and receive flashing light CW at about four words per minute. And that's, is, was this how they would teach CW, was with a flashing light rather than a sound? It was a requirement that you be able to uh, send and receive CW with flashing light because that was a, a mode of communications uh, during radio silence. Uh, oh, from ship to ship. Yes, yes. Ah, uh, uh, Okay. Well, how about that? Well, that would that does make sense. That would be CW. Uh, and at four words per minute doesn't sound very fast, but if you're uh, operating a um, a signal light, that's that's pretty fast. <laughs> and do you remember what your first call sign was? Yes, Kilo Two Lima Bravo Mike. And that was a uh, general class, or no? That was a uh, that I was actually KN two. I had a novice class uh-huh. first. And then I went to the general class later on. The uh, I've held several lights uh, call signs along the way. So you were a novice first. Yes. And uh, and you were in the Coast Guard Academy at the time that you got the novice. That's correct. Yeah. Did you have any Elmers or mentors uh, at the Coast Guard uh, who were hams? Yeah, we had a uh, a group of people there who were all members of the Amateur Radio Club, uh, and there were several. I can't pick out any one in particular, but there were a lot of people who. Uh, we're always willing to help you uh, get your code practice up. Uh, they administered the tests at the time because being in the military, the, the FCC allowed um, 
what was not what was now routine in terms of having mm-hmm. uh, an amateur radio operator administer a test. That was done for the military back in those days. So I only sat for my at an FCC exam when I went for my general class. Uh, in New York at the FCC field. Uh, no, that was something <laughs> that was in actually Washington, DC. Ah. Uh-huh. So I went to the, the home of the FCC. I went to the main office. <laughs> When you were in the military and you had this new uh, novice license, was, was there a ham station there at the, the um, yes, there was. Coast Guard Academy? Yes, we had an amateur radio station and an interesting antenna system. The, the, the radio station was on the fourth floor of a, a barracks area, and the barracks building was built as a large U-shaped building. Mm-hmm. And we were up actually in the attic area. And we had a, a, a long line, long wire antenna that was inside the attic area. And we used to tune it up by using fluorescent bulbs to make sure it was tuned properly. I, I remember as a kid that we used to, we actually used to tune our transmitter into an incandescent light bulb. Yes. Uh, just to make sure that we could tune it up before we, um, we put, it, put it into the antenna. Oh, yes. I can recall doing that. At this point, you didn't have a ham station of your own, or, or do you, do you, did you have a ham station at home? Uh, no, I did not, no. Um, my first at-home station was about mm-hmm. 1967 or thereabouts. Up until that point, mm-hmm. I'd always used the military ham, uh, ham stations, the club stations. Um, my first actual station was a B&W 6100 with a Hammerlund receiver. Uh, the B&W 6100 was a, was a single sideband phasing transceiver with more wow. controls on the front panel than you, you would uh, ever want to see. <laughs> and do you remember which Hammerland receiver you had? I can't recall. Uh, it's too far back. Uh-huh. And they were beautiful in those days. Yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah. Big. Very big. <laughs> they were, Yeah, of course. Um, how did Hamp Radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education career after the military? Um, well, actually, I have 24 years active duty. I retired active wow. as an active duty member from the Coast Guard, uh-huh. plus an additional 13 years as a civil service uh, member in the Coast Guard. So I've got about 37 years with the Coast Guard, and it's all been primarily in the realm of electronics and software development. Uh-huh. Uh, I was very instrumental in a lot of the... Hardware development for the Loran C system. It's no longer an active navigation system, but it was at one time. Um, and just before I retired in 2000, I was the lead for all of the Coast Guard software development. I would imagine that during your tenure at the Coast Guard, that the duties of the Coast Guard expanded as a result of the war on drugs. Yes, that's true. Yeah, uh-huh. at, for interdiction of drugs that are trying to be smuggled into the country um, by sea. Uh-huh. And so, and there's quite a bit of that, a lot in the Caribbean and even on the West Coast. Uh, drug, drug people bringing up drugs, um, even, in, believe it or not, in uh, homemade submarines. So tell me, as a, as a career military man in the Coast Guard, did you always live in military housing, and uh, therefore were you able to operate? No. Uh, the the Coast Guard uh, doesn't maintain a whole lot of uh, military housing, so you're mm-hmm. usually on your own. But I, I went to the Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey, California, and of course I lived in Navy housing at that time. Um, I did have uh, a, a, both an amateur radio operating station at home, and I also used the one at the school. I was stationed in Alaska at a, a remote, isolated duty station during the 1964-65, mm-hmm. and that was the time when we had the very big earthquake in Alaska. And I did have uh, an amateur radio station with me at the time there. An interesting antenna. It was the only time I was able to build a rhombic, and that was a very large rhombic, 600 foot on, a, on each leg, and it was a terminated rhombic aimed to the east coast of the United States. Mm-hmm. And where were you in uh, in Alaska? Uh, stationed in a, in a place called Yakutat, and that's uh, in the Tongass National Forest, about halfway between Anchorage and Juneau. Um, it's a community of about 500 Clinkett Indians. 
So there was plenty of real estate for a rhombic antenna. Oh, more than enough. <laughs> uh-huh. And lots of, lots of trees to hang it from. Perform? I'm sorry? And how did that antenna perform to the East Coast? I was going to tell you how well it performed. Um, at the time of the earthquake, uh, Yakutat was declared to have been obliterated from the Earth. At least that's what many of the broadcast stations had, had announced. And, of course, my wife was not with me. She was at, back in, in the New York area with our two children at the time. And she was wondering whatever, what would happen to me up there. And I was able to get on the radio, on a ham radio, and make one call to, for, for a contact to the East Coast. And I, and, and I called for the New York City area. And within that one call, I had about a dozen stations willing to help me. And so I had a, uh, a nice phone patch. Mm-hmm. which allowed me to ensure her that I was still alive and she was not ready to cash in the insurance money. <laughs> <laughs> so so obviously it, it sounds to me like perhaps um, your military career actually had more of an impact on your family life than amateur radio did. But what kind of impact did uh, amateur radio have on your family life? Well, that was a positive impact, certainly because my wife was able to be reassured that I was still around. Mm-hmm. But um, it's had a negative impact in a lot of ways, mostly because um, I'm so intense about what I do. And uh, my wife likes to say that she's a ham radio widow. And uh, so I have to be careful I don't allow my interests in ham radio to overwhelm my domestic duties. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> but I think that's probably true of a lot of amateur radio operators. Yeah, my, my wife decided she wanted to pursue a PhD about four years ago, and I said, oh, what a great idea, because if she's pursuing her PhD, I'm doing amateur radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about to end. I have to find her some other avocation. Okay. <laughs> you have two children. I have, um, are no, actually, children? I have, I have three boys, ah, three sons, okay. and they're all age 50 and over at this point. And any of them ham radio operators? None, but they were all in the electronics industry. So what what kind of rig do you operate now? I have a Yaesu uh, FT950 that I use most of the time. I also have a Tentac Pegasus and a Kachina 505 DSP. Uh, the Kachinas were actually very, very nice transceivers, but um, probably overpriced for and weren't very successful at the during the period of time that they sold them. Okay, and it's my understanding, because um, you, you make a note someplace, that um, you run a 2-meter copper magnetic loop antenna on 40, 30, and 20. I, I have a – that's right. I have a 2-meter copper loop antenna that I built. I use it mostly on 30, um, primarily because I, I failed to complete my control unit for the uh, variable – vacuum variable. <laughs> and so I, I leave it set on 30 meters. It works great. Uh huh. And and what is it exactly? Uh, and w- when you say two meters in diameter, that's a pretty that's a pretty large loop antenna. Yes. What's the diameter of the tube that you're using? Oh, I'm using three quarter inch copper tubing, and it, I'm I'm sitting right here looking at it out my window. It's only about um, five meters away from me, mm-hmm. and um, it's all all kind of brazed construction, and it wow. ha- with a uh, very small copper ground wire piece of copper ground wire used for the uh, driving element. It, Amazing. And how, how does that antenna perform compared to your wire antennas? Because I understand you've got, you know, you also have some uh, fan dipoles. And right, fan dipoles. Well. And I also have a vertical that can tune to 30. Um, it performs equally well. I've used it um, in comparison by looking at um, some of the reports from some of the robot receiving stations. Mm-hmm. And it's about equal. And it's it's a quiet antenna compared to say the vertical. Yes. Oh, very very quiet. Yes. What's interesting is I have the antenna so that the null of the of the antenna is aimed at my ham shack, uh-huh. and I can go in the air with 100 watts and never get any RFI in the shack. And the antenna is just within almost within arm's reach uh, of your ham shack. Yes. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's. Oh, that that's one of my projects this summer is to build a a 20 meter uh, receiving loop. Um, because of the electronic noise we have here. Yes. Oh, well, it'll reduce it quite a bit. So what's your favorite operating mode? Well, for years it was CW. Uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't even find a microphone unless I was absolutely forced to do so. 
Um, but I lost my hearing about the time I retired in 2000. And so CW became more and more difficult. And a friend of mine suggested that I should think about digital modes. And he suggested I look at a program called GMFSK. I don't know if you're familiar with that one or not, but GMFSK was written by a fellow named Tommy Maninen, OH2BNS. And I think Tony was had um, – I think he was going to school and it was becoming too difficult for him to maintain it. So by just by de facto, I became the maintainer of the program, made some changes. Um, I didn't intend to publish it, but somehow it leaked out that I had made changes to GMFSK. And so for th- about three years, I was the maintainer for that program. At that point, I decided okay. yeah. um, I might want to try to do this on my own. And Tommy's code was excellent. I could take most of it, and using it as a basis, I could write a C++ application, which turned out eventually to be FL Digi. But um, since that time, uh, I'm, I operate almost entirely digital mode. My favorite two modes are PSK31 and MFSK16. But I think that's simply because they're, easy, they're the easiest ones to make a QSO with. Uh-huh. There's so many people out there using them. There are better modes than either one of the two. Mm-hmm. But they're the mo- they seem to be the most popular. Yes, they are the most popular. Well, you know, you're best known for FL Digi, and um, and you now have a, a very respectable list of free software products with the FL designation in front. Can you uh, talk a little bit about FL Digi and, and what it is and um, why someone would use FL Digi if they're pursuing the digital modes? Well, the first thing is it's, um, it's public domain software. Uh, because it was based in part on some of the work that Tomy did, uh, it continued to be a general public licensed software, which means that all of the code is available to you. So if you have any skills at all, in the C++ language, or if you'd like to become skilled in it, it the code itself is, is like a textbook on how to design uh, digital signal processing elements for both encoding and decoding uh, digital transmissions. There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, of uh, comments in there which allows you to really understand what's happening internally. It, FLDG is a, a general purpose digital signal processing modem program that allows you to send and receive on about, I think the current count is around 40 different digital modes, if you include all of the sub-modes. Uh, it includes the ability to send images using uh, MFSK in a picture mode. Um, really, it, the digital modes are a fantastic way to communicate because you can have nearly 100% QSO, uh, a signal-to-noise ratio that is much below what you could ever expect to even do with CW. Plus, you have all of the uh, you have all of the ASCII characters. Yes, uh, actually, mm-hmm. FLDG uses a UTF-8 character set, mm-hmm. so it, it's beyond the ASCII character set. Um, you can send and receive in Cyrillic. Uh, which would include Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, probably Czechoslovakian, uh, as, mm-hmm. a, as an example. Uh, you could send and receive using the, U- the Hebrew character set if, mm-hmm. it were, if it's available in the UTF-8 format. Mm-hmm. Um, Voice of America uses FL Digi for all of its digital broadcast over its AM uh, broadcast radios. And they routinely send uh, out broadcasts in Chinese or other uh, Asian languages that are use the UTF-8 character set. So it's it's pretty 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 widely used by a number of different places outside of amateur radio, even. Well, that's amazing. So Voice of America has identified a user base of of. Listeners that actually could use uh, FL Digi, or you know, to actually receive, or something like that. Yes, that's cr- that's true. Um, wow. And there's an I have a, one of my FL Digi was originally my own creation, but over the years it's grown much beyond what I can do. 
I have a team of about 20 different developers who are ver- at various times are either active or, or idle, but they're all there. Uh, it's a worldwide consortium, including mm-hmm. people in Australia, uh, n- South Africa, New Zealand, um, Israel. Um, there's a gentleman in Australia who has taken all of the FL Digi code and ported it over to a, an Android application. He calls it AND FL Message. It's a combination of FL Digi and the FL Message uh, generator that I wrote. And it can be used to receive uh, any of the digital broadcasts, including the ones made by VOA. Um, the Voice of America, after they've made their publish, they use, he, the fellow named Kim Elliott uh, usually sends me some feedback as to various reception reports. And mm-hmm. some of those were by people uh, receiving the FL Digi digital, digital broadcast using a, um, a tablet, an Android tablet, or even a, an Android phone. So they're actually receiving off the air signal, or the Voice of America is, um, is kind of pumping FL Digi into the internet somehow? I mean, no, it's off the air, on, on the air. Uh-huh. Um, th- th- and in fact, if you visit VOA, uh, online site, you can probably look up what their schedule is for the broadcast. Um, it's every Saturday and Sunday, uh-huh. and there's several broadcasts on de- different frequencies from different transmitting stations around the world, some in the U.S., some in oh, um, Asia, and some in Europe. You probably get the one from Germany very well. Oh, so I understand what's going on. So they've got the speaker turned up on the radio, and they, they're using the microphone on the android that's correct device that's a, ah, oh. that's how they're doing it um oh okay a, and the broadcast from from voa is on am radio and so you can either listen to it you know the am broadcast or you could look at upper or lower sideband to look at one of the two um but it, it's it's really quite effective they they he's tried testing it with um uh, the fl digi broadcast in the background with music still continuing in the foreground and that works, but it, the music sometimes provides um, the equivalent of noise background. So most of the time, his broadcasts are only in the FL Digi digital mode, and it's just applied to the AM signal. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, um, it's really cool. And he, he, Yeah, it's very cool. He always sends um, MFSK as well as other modes. It, the primary mode he uses is MFSK, and so he'll always send uh, a sequence of digital photos, images, along with various elements of the broadcast. Well, now you've, now you've piqued my interest in um, just to see what the Voice of America is doing. Yeah, you'll have to download FL Digi so you can receive it. Uh, ab- absolutely. Well, you know what? When I was looking at the FL Digi site, it appeared to me that, that there's a lot of other features in FL Digi. That have been added. Well, can you explain, you know, what other things that FLG do, Digi does besides encoding and decoding the um, the various digital modes? Sure. Um, if you look at the at my website, you'll see that um, there's a number of the FL applications. By the way, FL stands for fast light because all of the the, the user interface uh, GUI code that I use to support the programs is the uh-huh. fast light toolkit FLTK. So I just kept the FL. It just <laughs> everyone wants to know what FL means. <laughs> well, it actually was one of my questions here on my list. Yeah, it's 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 borrowed from FLTK, which is the toolkit used for the for the user interface. Um, okay. But my one of my interests, and I guess generated by my experience in Alaska so many years ago, fifty almost now at this point, um, mm-hmm. is in emergency communications. And so much of what FL Digi has been designed to do over the last several years is to be a platform for the base platform for emergency communications. And in fact, if you look on there, you'll see something called, um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting up. My, my brain is getting cramped. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. there, there's a sequence of programs in there that are all designed specifically for the EMCOM usage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that includes FLARQ, which is an, an amateur radio receive request 
uh, type of thing. So it's mm-hmm. think of the the old days we used to um, do uh, packet and right you know, packet, digipeding. Yeah, digipeding. FLARQ right. provides that kind of facility. It means that you can pass data back and forth um, in a way that you have a checksum associated with all of data. And so you know for sure that whether or not it's been received correctly or not. If not, it's you re, you do a repeat request. Um, there's a there's a something called FLAMP, which is amateur multicast protocol, and that's a way of doing broadcasts over a repeated broadcasts so that the receiver can can receive the same broadcast multiple times, mm-hmm. and when the broadcast has been received in its entirety. And checksum, so it's not that the, the rece- reception has been a hundred percent. Then that individual will know that it's received that. So that's being used in multiple ways in the emergency communications arena. There's something called FL Message, which is a forms manager with a, many many different forms that are already that are canned and, and ready to go, or um, any kind of an HTML form can be used as the basis for a form within that program. But all of these things that I just mentioned so far are specifically um, designed to be used by the emergency communications people, RACES, ARIES, and those type of people. And they're all interfaced directly or indirectly to FL Digi. So, for example, FL AMP uh, send is, is, communicates via a socket interface with FL Digi so it can control whether FL Digi is transmitting or receiving, etc. Uh, the same thing with FL Message. If if you if you were on a an emergency communications frequency and FL Digi decoded a an FL Message formatted a transmission, it would automatically open up FL Message and display the message that came in. So there's a lot of um, Ancillary things going on that um, pe- a lot of people don't use, but it was there because of my interest in in the emergency communications field. And I'm not a RACES member. I'm not an ARIES member. So mm-hmm. I, I have I, I only do I create these things for other people to use. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you got my my brain is sitting here, um, you know, spinning at a hundred miles an hour in terms of. Uh, what you could do with this. So, so this means if I wanted to set up, you know, with my friends here, a an emergency uh, message network. Yes. You know that that works the whole country. Uh, now our country is the size of New Jersey, but um, <laughs> it's not like the United States. But you could use um, like forty meters, for example, as a message handling network. Yes. And you could actually, you know, spit the message into the system, and it could find its way from one end to the other, even if it has to be repeated some intermediate points along the way. That's correct. Uh, FL AMP, for example, has the ability to uh, operate in a repeat mode so that mm-hmm. uh, station A can uh, initiate the initial initial broadcast and uh, station B or C down the line could rebroadcast it. And the final recipient could be receiving the information from both, from A, B, and C and, wow. and reassembling the entire message. Do you know if there's any um, message networks in place across the world that are already doing this? Uh, yes, there are. Most of them are in the U.S. Uh-huh. And there's a there's probably a twenty or so different uh, EM com groups that are using all of this software uh, sp- during real em- real uh, emergency emergencies and also during uh, much of their drills. Mm-hmm. Um, the the northeast part of our country, uh, in the particularly Massachusetts, got hit very hard this last um, winter season by very heavy snowfalls mm-hmm, and, right. and other other storms. And the uh, Cape Cod uh, Aries group used FL Digi and all of, of the other programs specifically for all of its uh, emergency communications. Um, and if, and they were doing it on on UHF VHF. Uh, which and it works equally well there, uh, either on sideband or FM. They they were using uh, FM on VHF, and there are some modes available for the UHF VHF operator that are extremely high speed, up to about six thousand words per minute. 
And so uh, it's almost like instant instant message servicing, uh, but uh-huh. but over amateur radio. And and so they were using the FL message with FL Digi and some of its very high speed PSK modes. Yeah, this comes up frequently in QSO today conversations, and, and that is 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 that you know the the internet infrastructure that we rely on so heavily is actually quite fragile. And um, I, I mean, I can think of a, a time just a few years ago when a, when a um, a ship threw its anchor in the water outside of Alexandria, e- Egypt, and snagged a submarine cable and took out most of the Middle East from the, from the internet. You know, as a result of that, yeah, my mind is spinning here in terms of um, ways that it would be possible to you know continue sending messages, uh, you know, uh, even through across gateways from um, you know, as third party traffic. Yes, you know. Um, from one end of the world to the other, just to let people know the things. Like I would imagine, for example, something like this um, in Nepal right now would be quite handy and useful. Yes, indeed, I think so. Um, all of the messages that are handled by by all of this software are mm-hmm. are pure text messages. There's, there's no there's no binary data involved in it. So um, the the file associated with the, tr- the data transfer could be picked up and transferred. If it's available via a um, an internet connection, but if mm-hmm. but when that's not available, then also this data can be sent via amateur radio. Um, I most of the times when they've when the drills have been run with other emergency communications people that might be like EMTs or hospitals, mm-hmm. they've really been surprised at how effective. Um, the, this communication mode of communication can be, and how well it transfers the data. Um, and there are some things that you know are very difficult to transfer if you are simply using voice radio. If you were trying to transfer a list of of um, drugs, for example, if you needed to have emergency uh, drug um, list of drugs to be sent to somebody, that'd be a very mm-hmm. difficult list to, to transfer uh, using voice. But it absolutely 100% transferred without any errors using all of these digital modes. Can you use FL Digi with the, any of the satellite modes? I mean, can you store up your messages for um, uh, interception by a, a, a satellite that might pass overhead? I don't know of anyone doing it right now, but there's no reason it couldn't be because it's simply an audio signal, mm-hmm. and it's like passing any other audio signal. Uh, that's just another... Medium. Well, what's on the drawing board for FL software products? Are there, do you have any ideas brewing right now in terms of what, what else you could do with it that you're not doing now? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, there is. So I'm always, Can you share? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm always doing something. <laughs> um, I don't know if you uh, recognize these two uh, gentlemen, but there's a fellow named Murray Greenman, uh, ZL1BPU, and Khan Wasilev. ZL2 AFP. Uh, they live in New Zealand, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Murray has, is the inventor of several different digital modes, in, including MFSK uh, and Domino EX. The, if you're not into digital modes, they may not be very. No, I've heard. I've heard of these actually. Actually, he's he's the man that invented them. Mm-hmm. Um, I invented one called Thor, which is very similar to um, Domino EX. But um, Murray has recently invented a, call, a, a mode called FSQ, and it stands for Fast Simple QSO, and it's um, a little bit different than most digital modes that people are used to because it's, as opposed to character-based, it's line-based. You, you type in a line of text, hit the return, and that line of text goes out, and you wait and return for another line of text coming back. A little bit slower, perhaps, than some of our modes now. But the the actual modem code is such that it can go to about minus 15 dB signal-to-noise ratio in terms of being able to be decoded successfully. Uh, so that that's pretty far down the noise. Right. So you're not even – with your ears, you're not even hearing. Yeah, you know, all you're hearing is noise. No, that's right. right. Yeah. You, you might be able – most digital mode modem programs use a waterfall to uh, – basically display um, a a frequency display in time 
mm-hmm. with the intensity of the signal being indicated by both color and color intensity. You might you might see some of those digital signals in there, but they would be mixed in among all the noise. But anyway, uh, he has a program called FSQCALL, FSQ Call, which was written by Khan, but it's only available in Windows. And I hate to admit it, but I, um, I'm kind of a Linux geek. I've, I've, uh-huh. I've done Unix all my life, uh, only Windows on the, only under duress. Uh, and so I was asked if I would um, include FSQ in, as a modem under FL Digi, and I've been working on that, and it's about at the 95% point. And in fact, um, all of all of FS, FL Digi is available in multiple operating systems. It's it's built on a Linux platform, and but I write a uh, cross compile it so it's available under Windows, and it's also available on OS X. So it's available on all the major OS platforms. And so well, I, I wrote that I wrote that you admitted that you actually own a. Windows computer. <laughs> uh, I have a Windows 8.1, a Windows XP, a Windows version 7. I need them because I have to test this stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. In fact, so you don't you don't drop that off to someone else. No, we're on an 8.1 right now, so I'm talking to you on Windows. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'm I'm rather uh, OS gnostic. That doesn't make any difference what I what I use, but I prefer Linux. But at any rate, uh, the ob- objective was to be able to add this new modem type called FSQ to FL Digi because it has uh, a lot of potential in the EMCOM community. It's, it really provi- can provide them with some additional tools to use. So that's probably going to be out in either the next version or the one after that. It's getting pretty close to being released. How long does it take um, for one of these new digital modes to propagate across the ham radio communica- community before you've got someone to talk to? Oh. I mean, does it take long? No, it doesn't. Um, as soon as you're out there and somebody recognizes a mode they haven't seen before, they're on the Internet looking to see what, what that was. <laughs> and so, uh-huh. uh, so it doesn't take very long. Um, and the Internet, you know, it, a lot – it's fragile, but it's it's super. I couldn't do any of this work if I didn't have the internet resources available to me. I have you know this group of twenty developers over the whole world, and we communicate almost all the time using the internet, and, and that's how we share our work. Well, I wasn't complaining about uh, in the internet. The internet makes it possible for me to sit here and talk to you the way I'm. You know, Absolutely. talking to you now and right. to be able to put out the QSO Today podcast. I guess my only concern is is, is that um, you know when there's a real natural disaster, you know it, you can't rely on it. Um, at least you know maybe not locally if the local interest infrastructure is um, has been buried or washed away or blown away. I live in Tornado Alley. In fact, the area I live in is is just north of Huntsville, Alabama. Uh-huh. And um, I've had tornadoes come within two and a half miles of the house. And so I'm very aware of what um, natural disasters can do to a, to the infrastructure. This is why you have wire antennas instead of that 60-foot tower that's, with the monster beam on the roof. Uh, actually, I would have the tower, but it, um, you know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and my wife would not think that a beautiful object. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's funny how different we are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> she, she, I, I keep telling my wife I want to I want to put a hex beam on the roof, and she said um, the, the the neighbors will, you know, burn you at the stake. <laughs> so well, they might do the same if you if you build your um, loop antenna. <laughs> you know, I put the loop antenna out on the back out on the back, and people will think it's a like a dream catcher or something like that. that, That'll be good. Uh, um, You're aware of, you know all about dream catchers. Well, I don't, but um, I know what they kind of look like. And um, and I probably could sell that to most of the neighbors. It's an American Indian thing, actually. Yeah. So with FL Digi then, if, if there's a new mode and you've got this new mode, you know, in the latest version of FL Digi, if I'm tuning around the band and I'm not, for example, uh, I haven't tried FSQ call, 
Will um, FLWG automatically switch into that mode and, and when, it, when it crosses the band and start decoding it and tell you what it is that you're looking at? Or do you actually have to manually go through and um, try each mode to see if you can decode what's there? That's a very good question, Eric. Um, there's a, a fellow named Patrick who's the developer of a um, another di- another digital mode program who created something uh, called RSID, which is a Reed Solomon identification sequence. And uh, RSID is a special transmission that can that precedes any di- can precede any digital trans- transmission. And when decoded, will will automatically take your your program, and either tell you what the new mode is, that, or, and or change to it automatically and start decoding it. Uh, FL Digi uses RSID identifiers for almost a hundred percent of its digital modems. It doesn't do it for some, and some of them you really don't need it. You don't want it for CW, for example. Um, and most people, if they've been around long enough can tune to a, a, a radio teletype signal and recognize uh, an RTT-Y signal just from the sound. Mm-hmm. Um, but many of the more esoteric modes, you wouldn't know what it was you were listening to unless you had spent many, many hours listening to them. So the RSID is an identifier code that's, that's, that's sent. It's, separate from, it's a separate type of a code from all the rest of them, and it allows your, your program to automatically identify the mode, change to it if you've configured it for that to do so. And so when I publish FSQ for FL Digi, it will have a, associated with it a, an identifier mode, an RSID code. Is that a convention that, that you've created, or is there like some uh, nas- international agreement on what these RSID codes should be um, for each of these modes? It's, a, it's an agreement between those of us who are in the development community for digital modem programs. Uh-huh. Um, the fellow who invented the, F, uh, the uh, RSID code is Patrick, and he created uh, multi-PSK which is mm. a p- program principally for Windows users. And he, he is rather possessive of the, of the codes, and, but, mm-hmm. he, but he gives out, he'll give out a block of codes to various developers, and he's done that for FL Digi. So for code sequence, modem codes, which are unique to FL Digi, I have a set of a block that I can draw upon uh, for this RSID assignment. But now, I got the impression from looking at your site with the FL Digi site that, that you also have some rig control. Yes. Uh, Can you t- talk about that a little bit? Yeah, FL Rig is um, a, a transceiver control program that that uh, has all of the back end code in it for about fifty different transceivers. Um, probably a vintage nineteen eighty plus to, to current. Um, mm-hmm. Supports many many different. Uh, transceiver manufacturers, and it's a common interface and a common user interface so that for every transceiver, the interface that you see on the computer screen, it's identical. That means that you know, some transceivers don't have every little bell and whistle that it's been key- uh, keyed for, but it, for every requirement for the digital mode operation, uh, those transceivers are supported. And so, for example, you can con- uh, via FL Digi uh, communicating to FL Rig, communicating to the transceiver, you can either query or control things like frequency, uh, mode of operation at the transceiver, bandwidth at the transceiver, um, notch filtering at the transceiver, uh, various other aspects of transceiver operation. Um, so uh, when I'm using FL Digi with my F, my Yesu FT950, I never touch the transceiver except to turn it on or off. Oh, interesting. So if I wanted to operate Whisper, we had um, Carol Malazzo, KP4MD, on who was uh, who was doing some experiments with um, with uh, Whisper in VHF and UHF. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to use the whisper mode when I'm working on some other, I'm working on some other transceiver, or I'm doing something else in my ham shack, and I wanted to kind of go through the different bands and beacon and receive, could you do that with FL Digi with NFL rig? No, 
Um, FL Digi does not support uh, the Whisper mode. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's not within the, uh, my, primarily because it, it doesn't fall into the EMCOM purview. Okay. But you could conceivably do something similar in one of the other digital modes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Even, even um, program it for different times. It, the way it's set up, there's, um, there are, there's a complete macro, what's called a macro language that's available to a mm-hmm. FL Digi user. And so he can he can set up for FL Digi to automatically change the transceiver at specific times, mm-hmm. so that it could move to a different frequency or different mode, different band. Wow, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, David, what, oh, go ahead. That's why there's about five hundred thousand lines of code. <laughs> so it's, it keeps you busy in your retirement. Oh yes, yeah. David, what's what is the biggest challenge to ham radio to you? I think the the integration of um, our our HF and VHF communications with the internet services, so that um, we can have transparency, especially for the emergency communications people. Uh, that that transparency isn't quite here yet. It takes a it takes a bit of of um, handling on a part of individuals to to get that message transport between the various media. I see. So what you're talking about perhaps is um, that barrier where the the licensed ham radio operator is actually the mediator between the the third-party traffic and the the, um, amateur radio service itself? Right. You know, some of that, of course, is limited by uh, regulations and laws within the various countries that we operate, either within or, or between. And so we have to be aware of those also. But I think we need to have a little bit more transparency between them so that um, if I'm sending a message from point A to point B, it shouldn't make any difference you know, how it, what, what, what the mode of, of transmission is. Hmm. Unless that that transmission is an advertisement, well, a, then, know, then you'd have a problem because that would be um, uh, prohibited prohibited yeah. under most laws. Well, what what advice would you give to a newer returning ham to amateur radio with all your years <laughs> experience? <laughs> Read the manual. <laughs> 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 well, you, you know better than that, David. We, as ham radio operators, we never read the manual. I just bought a new automobile, and before I drove it, I read the manual. <laughs> but I, I'm <laughs> probably unique. Uh, no, most people just figure they can fly by the seat of the pants. Um, I guess the best advice I can give people it would be, if they, especially if they're into the digital modes, uh-huh. is to seek out help on the Internet. And there are... Uh, there are for FL Digi, for example, and then for others, um, FL Digi has three different uh, Yahoo groups with uh, approximately eight thousand members uh, between the three of them. Um, depending upon whether you're a Windows operator or, or a Linux operator or an OS X operator, or if you're interested primarily in emergency communications, you would nav- you would probably uh, Move to one of those three different groups. Uh, I could let you have the names of them, but they're all acronyms. So, but you can look them up on the, on. No, uh, what I'll do is I'll look them all up and I'll put them in the show notes page. That's good. But the, there's always they're all Elmers on there. They're all willing to help you, and so uh-huh. there's all kinds of help available to a new, especially a a, a, a novice operator within the digital modes. This is a whole universe that I'm not familiar with. This is really cool. Uh, I, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm grateful that you came on to QSO today, David. And from looking at FL Digi and hearing what you're saying, um, I guess I have to expand my list of to-dos this year, and, and that, that's to include um, starting to operate some of the digital modes just to see how they work out for me. Oh, I think you'll love it. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me on QSO today. Again, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. 73. It's been my pleasure. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed my QSO Today with David W1HKJ. 
Be sure to check out the show notes page at www.qsotoday.com and put in W1HKJ in the search bar at the top of the page. I will post links to the references that David made in the podcast. If you have any questions for David, please be sure to put them in the comments section at the bottom of the W1HKJ show notes page. QSO Today is available in the iTunes Store and in the Stitcher podcast app for both iPhone and Android. There are links to these places on the QSO Today website. I'm always on the lookout for interesting guests for the podcast. Your suggestions are very important to finding QSO Today guests. Please send me your suggestions on the comments page at www.qsotoday.com at the website. Please take the time to join the QSO Today community. There are buttons on the website and on the show notes page for this. I promise not to spam you or share your email address with anyone. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. Hallo, liebe SWLs, YLs und OM. Sie hören den Deutschlandrundspruch Nummer 44 des Deutschen Amateurradioclubs für die 44. Kalenderwoche 2018. Diesmal haben wir Meldungen zu folgenden Themen. 95 Jahre Rundfunk in Deutschland. Die belgische Regulierungsbehörde schlägt eine neue Lizenzklasse vor. Jetzt anmelden und Tische sichern für den Funktag 2019. Felicitas Wolf, Delta Lima 9, X-Ray Bravo Bravo, im Amt der Distriktsvorsitzenden Hamburg bestätigt. Aktive der Ausbildung, Jugendarbeit und Weiterbildung trafen sich in Baunatal. Dann haben wir aktuelle Conteste im Programm und was gibt es Neues vom Funkwetter. Erstes Thema im Deutschlandrundspruch 95 Jahre Rundfunk in Deutschland. Vor 95 Jahren, am 29. Oktober 1923, startete eine neue Ära. Die erste Radiosendung Deutschlands ging vom Berliner Voxhaus in den Äther. Mit einem 500 Watt Mittelwellensender auf 750 Kilohertz begann das Zeitalter des Rundfunks. Radio DARC erinnerte am 28. Oktober mit einer Themen-Sondersendung an dieses historische Ereignis. Es wurde, wie auch schon im Jahr 1923, in Amplitudenmodulation gesendet. Wer die Sendung verpasst hat, kann sich diese über das Sendungsarchiv herunterladen. Darüber informiert Rainer Englert, Delta Fox 2, November Uniform. Das Rundfunkjubiläum feierte auch der Sender Alex Radio Berlin, indem er die Themensendung von Radio DARC am 29. Oktober zum 95. Jahrestag der ersten Rundfunksendung aus dem Boxhaus Berlin ausstrahlte. Weitere Infos zum Sender gibt es ebenfalls über das Internet. Darüber informiert Jörg Drechsel, Delta Mike 4, Delta Lima. Belgische Regulierungsbehörde schlägt neue Lizenzklasse vor. In Belgien soll eine neue Novizen-Lizenzklasse eingeführt werden. Das gab die belgische Regulierungsbehörde BIPT bei einem Treffen mit anerkannten belgischen Amateurfunkverbänden Ende September bekannt. Im Hinblick auf den Schwierigkeitsgrad der Prüfung soll diese zwischen der bestehenden Basis und der sogenannten HAREC-Lizenz, also der Volllizenz, liegen. Das solle sich dann auch in den jeweiligen Privilegien wie Bänder, Sendeleistung und Modi widerspiegeln. Die bestehende Basislizenz mit Oscar November 3 Rufzeichen sollte weiterhin bestehen bleiben. Oscar November 3 Lizenzinhaber müssen sich jedoch auf Veränderungen einstellen. Eine separate Prüfungsform ist für die Novizenlizenz nicht vorgesehen. Die Grundlage soll vielmehr die Harek-Prüfung bilden. Wird diese mit mindestens 66% bestanden, berechtigt dies zu einer Volllizenz für alle Bänder und einer maximalen Sendeleistung von 1500 Watt. Werden insgesamt 50 Prozent in allen Prüfungsteilen erreicht, gibt dies das Recht auf die Novizenlizenz mit einem Oscar November 2 Präfix. Diese umfasst den Zugang zu allen Kurzwellenbändern, wobei das 60 Meter Band ausgenommen ist, sowie dem 6 Meter Band bei einer maximalen durchschnittlichen Sendeleistung von 100 Watt, sowie die Bänder 2 Meter und 70 Zentimeter mit jeweils einer durchschnittlichen Sendeleistung bis zu 50 Watt. Die derzeitigen Oscar November 2 Lizenzinhaber behalten ihre Lizenz und ihr Rufzeichen. Die Basislizenz ist auf 10 Watt durchschnittliche Sendeleistung begrenzt. Zudem sind zum Teil nur einzelne Segmente in den Kurzwellenbändern für Basislizenzinhaber freigegeben. Im Vergleich zu heute vergrößern sich zwar einige dieser Segmente, dafür soll die Nutzung der Bänder 17, 12 und 6 Meter entfallen. ATV ist den Inhabern der Basislizenz nicht gestattet. 
Laut BIPT hat sich gezeigt, dass der Unterschied zwischen Basislizenz und einer Volllizenz gemäß HAREC viel zu klein sei. Daher müssten einige wichtige Änderungen vorgenommen werden. Ziel sei es, die Privilegien der Basis, der Novizen und der HAREC-Lizenz ausreichend voneinander abzugrenzen, damit ein Anreiz für Funkamateure besteht, jeweils die nächsthöhere Lizenzklasse zu erreichen. Darüber berichtet der DARC HF-Referent Tom Kamp, Delta Fox 5, Julia. Lima. Jetzt anmelden und Tische sichern für den Funktag 2019. Nach den erfolgreichen Veranstaltungen der vergangenen Jahre findet der Funktag Kassel am 6. April 2019 von 9 bis 16 Uhr zum vierten Mal statt. Die Veranstalter, dies ist der DARC Verlag mit dem ideellen Träger DARC e.V., erwarten bis zu 3000 Besucher auf dem Messegelände in Kassel. Ab sofort haben private Anbieter über das Internet die Möglichkeit, sich für den Flohmarktbereich der insgesamt 160 Tische umfasst, anzumelden. Neben der Anmeldephase wird aktuell auch an der Ausgestaltung des Rahmenprogramms gearbeitet. So wird ein Vortragsprogramm, eine Experimentierwerkstatt, eine Ausstellung im Außengelände sowie weitere Highlights in Planung. Weitere Informationen zum vierten Funktag Kassel finden Sie in Kürze über die Veranstaltungswebseite. Die URL lautet funktag-kassel.de. Felicitas Wolf, DL9XBB, im Amt der Distriktsvorsitzenden Hamburg bestätigt. Bei der Herbstversammlung des DARC Distriktes Hamburg, Distrikt Echo, am 27. Oktober stand auch die Wahl des Vorstandes auf dem Programm. Felicitas Wolf, DL9XBB, wurde mit 97 Prozent der Stimmen und somit einer sehr großen Mehrheit wiedergewählt. Ihre Vertreter Mike Kaplusch, DB1BMK, und Jan Hendrik Schulz, DG8HJ, wurden ohne Gegenstimme in ihrem im Amt bestätigt. Die bisherigen Referenten hatten sich mit Ausnahme des ARDF-Referenten für eine weitere Amtszeit bereit erklärt und wurden wiederernannt. Aktive der Ausbildung, Jugendarbeit und Weiterbildung trafen sich in Baunatal. Der Einladung zur Referatstagung Ausbildung, Jugendarbeit und Weiterbildung nach Baunatal folgten am letzten Oktoberwochenende 19 aktive Funkamateure aus zwölf verschiedenen Distrikten. Dieses Treffen findet einmal im Jahr statt und dient dem Informationsaustausch sowie dem Wissenstransfer. Die drei Bundesreferenten Gerrit Herzig, DH8GHH für den Bereich Nord, Lars Weiler, DC4LW für den Bereich Ost und Axel Thüner, DF9VI für den Bereich Süd, legten den Fokus in diesem Herbst insbesondere auf das Abstimmen des Handwerkszeugs, welches die Referenten für die erfolgreiche AJW-Arbeit benötigen. Dazu gehören die neue Lehrgangskarte, DARC-Mailinglisten, Umgang mit Jugendlichen und Gruppenpädagogik. Im Laufe der Gespräche wurde ein unklares Bild über die Aufgaben der Distriktsreferate für AJW festgestellt. Hier wurde mit einer spontanen Mitmachaktion zur Aufgabendefinition eine Hilfestellung für alle bestehenden und zukünftigen Mitwirkenden im Referat erarbeitet. Die Tagungsunterlagen werden in den kommenden Tagen im Bereich AJW für alle DRC-Mitglieder zur Verfügung gestellt. Aktuelle Conteste am 1. November, da läuft der Holzhammer Contest. 3. November, da läuft der IPA Radio Club Contest. Das ganze Wochenende hindurch, 3. 4. November, da kommt aus der Ukraine der Ukrainian DX Contest zu uns und in der IARU Region 1 läuft der Marconi Contest VHF in CW im 2 Meter Band. 4. November, da läuft dann der IPA Radio Club Contest Teil 2 sowie der HSC CW Contest. Am 5. bis 11. November, da finden die VFDB Aktivitätstage auf Kurzwelle statt. Am 10. November startet das Aktivitätswochenende Schleswig-Holstein. 10. bis 11. November der WAE DX Contest in Japan, der Juliet Alpha International DX Contest. Dann der Firak HF Contest sowie in Tschechien und der Slowakei der Oscar Kilo Oscar Mike DX Contest. Am 11. November geht's dann weiter mit dem Aktivitätswochenende Schleswig-Holstein und dem zweiten Teil. Am 12. November findet dann eine Military on the Air Aktivität statt. Die Ausschreibungen finden Sie auf der Webseite des Contestreferates sowie mittels der Contest-Termintabelle in der CQDL in der aktuellen Ausgabe 11 2018 auf Seite 54. 
Der Funkwetterbericht vom 30. Oktober, herausgegeben diesmal von Christian Reiber, Delta Lima 8, Mike Delta Whisky. Zunächst der Rückblick, auf der Sonne nichts Neues, der solare Flux verweilte knapp unter der Marke von 70 Fluxeinheiten und die Sonnenoberfläche zeigte sich durchweg fleckenlos. Auch der Sonnenwind strömte ruhig und gleichmäßig dahin, lediglich am Samstag frischte er etwas auf, was das Erdmagnetfeld aber kaum aus der Ruhe brachte. Unter dem Strich waren das ruhige Bedingungen bei sehr geringer Sonnenaktivität. Der Tagesgang der Grenzfrequenz FOF2 der Ionosphäre ist bereits sehr winterlich geprägt. Nach Sonnenaufgang öffnen 30, 20 und 17 Meter sehr schnell und die höchste nutzbare Frequenz liegt mittags bei fast 25 Megahertz. Nach Sonnenuntergang schließen dann die Bänder genauso rasant, wobei 30 Meter bis weit in die Nacht nutzbar bleibt. Der CQ Worldwide SSB Contest am vergangenen Wochenende profitierte von den ruhigen Bedingungen, auch wenn man sich mehr Sonnenaktivität wünschen würde, aber wir sind ja nun mal im solaren Aktivitätsminimum. Verbindungen gelangen auf allen Bändern bis 15 Meter. Vorhersage bis zum 6. November, die Sonnenaktivität bleibt auf niedrigem Niveau. Kräftiger Sonnenwind aus einem großen koronalen Loch ist unterwegs. Er wird zum Beginn des nächsten Wochenendes bei der Erde eintreffen und die nächste geomagnetische Störung auslösen. Dieses koronale Loch ist ein alter Bekannter. Seit Juli taucht es mit jeder Sonnenrotation erneut auf und wird dabei jedes Mal größer. Auf zwei unruhigere Tage sollten wir uns einstellen. Bis dahin bleibt das Erdmagnetfeld sehr ruhig. Das ist gut für die Ausbreitung auf den unteren Bändern. Tagsüber öffnen dann die Bänder dauerhaft bis 17 Meter und auch 15 Meter bietet regelmäßig Möglichkeiten für DX. Und hier noch die Orientierungszeiten für Greyline DX, alle Zeiten in UTC. Sonnenaufgang in Neuseeland ist um 17.14 Uhr, in Ostaustralien um 19.11 Uhr in Westaustralien um 21.17 Uhr, in Singapur geht die Sonne auf um 22.46 Uhr Weltzeit, in Japan um 21 Uhr, auf Hawaii um 16.35 Uhr, in Anchorage in Alaska, dort geht die Sonne auf um 17.33 Uhr UTC, in Johannesburg in Südafrika um 3.17 Uhr, an der USA-Westküste in Kalifornien um 14.36 Uhr, auf den Falterninseln um 8.09 Uhr und in Berlin in Deutschland geht die Sonne auf um 6.06 Uhr Weltzeit. Sonnenuntergang USA-Ostküste 21.50 Uhr, USA-Westküste 1.09 Uhr, in Sao Paulo in Brasilien, dort geht die Sonne unter um 21.21 Uhr UTC, auf den Falterninseln um 23.02 Uhr, auf Hawaii um 3.54 Uhr, in Anchorage in Alaska, dort geht die Sonne unter um 1.52 Uhr UTC, in Johannesburg in Südafrika um 16.26 Uhr, in Neuseeland um 6.55 Uhr und in Berlin in Deutschland verschwindet die Sonne um 15.34 Uhr UTC hinter dem Horizont. Das war der DARC Deutschland Rundspruch für diese Woche. Die Redaktion hatte diesmal Stefan Hüpper, DH5 FFL vom Amateurfunkmagazin CQDL. Wenn Sie Meldungen für den Deutschland Rundspruch haben, also Infos mit bundesweiter Relevanz, dann schicken Sie bitte Ihre Beiträge und Texte gerne per Post oder Fax an die Redaktion CQDL sowie per E-Mail bitte ausschließlich an die Adresse redaktion.darc.de. Diesen Rundspruch gibt es auch als PDF und MP3-Datei auf der DARC-Webseite in Packet Radio unter der Rubrik DARC sowie per E-Mail-Abonnement. Über die DARC-Webseite können Sie sich dazu jederzeit an- und abmelden. Bitte bewahren Sie dazu Ihre Mitgliedsnummer und Ihr Passwort stets griffbereit auf. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören und AWDH. Bis zur nächsten Woche. Und an alle Mächtiges 88. PA00 News følgende udsendelse indeholder nogle chokerende eksempler på, hvordan en hobby kan ændre liv i unge under 18. Kraftigt til stedeværelsen af en voksen anbefales. 7, 8, 4, 0, 5, 1, 2, 7, 4, 8, 9, 7. Achtung alle Mitarbeiter der Nachrichtendienste, bitte beachten Sie Freitagabends die Sendungen PA00 News für die wichtigsten weitere Informationen. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo.